And I am going to be seated today. I know that's weird. We'll see if I can stay seated, right? So I was, um, I'm going to start standing, then I'll sit down, hopefully, um, because I feel like it's, it's kind of what the Lord told me in, in the midnight hours last night at about one. I was wrestling with um, just this message that I have, and I, I just, you know, I just couldn't, I just couldn't get that piece of, of this is what needs to be said. So I was just grappling, thinking, no, I'm going to, I'm going to change it up a little bit. I'm going to go this direction. And God said, no, I want you to sit down and I want you to have a conversation with the people in the house. Um, and, and how I view that as being different from preaching, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it is kind of the same thing, but I, I feel like preaching is like a sermon that you, you get the slides and you get to, um, I don't know, you just get to think, wow, that was great, versus, versus coming to coffee with me and having a conversation. Does that make sense? Just the intimacy of what I have to share with you this morning, I, I want it to be intimate with you. And I don't get to go to coffee with each of you. I don't get to, to go to lunch with each of you. I don't get to share my life with you in that way. And so that's kind of what I want to do this morning. So more than a sermon, more than <clears throat> taking notes or taking pictures of a cool slide or um, being awed by a fabulous message, speaking of, um, wasn't last week just probably one of the greatest messages I have ever heard. It was, it was so, so good. Um, Today, I just want it to be a little different. I want to converse with you about you and me and Jesus and this whole follow, grow, go concept that we're dealing with. So are y'all, y'all cool with that? Okay, so I hope that that makes sense where I'm headed. So Father, I thank you for this day. I thank you for the blessings that you've given me. Lord, I thank you for the words that you have spoken to me. I ask this morning, God, that you would just make yourself present with us in us and among us. Lord, I thank you that you lead, you speak, you direct. And I thank you, God, that in this whole series, Lord, we are becoming the people of God that you long for us to be on this corner. And it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Amen. One of the things that um, I, I think is most interesting about society is is part of what Mark mentioned last week. The knowledge that we have is just overwhelming, right? We talked about that a little bit just with, with God and the knowledge that we have um, from him. I, I am not from 2023, right? I grew up in the 80s. We had three TV channels. I still remember them. It was 11, 12, and 22. NBC, ABC, and CBS. Y'all remember that? So, I mean, just three channels. That was it. Just a few little things to watch, a few little things on the weekend. Cartoons were only on Saturday. It was just so simple. It was a simple life. The 80s were simple. So, um, you know, one of the things I remember about being a kid in the 80s is if my mom told me to do something, there was not a lot of comfort. My mom never quite, she didn't ask me, how are you feeling about what I'm asking you to do? Right? She just told me to do something and, and I did it. So that's just kind of how it went in the 80s. She wasn't very concerned about if it was going to throw me into counseling, if it was going to produce anxiety in me. Right? If she, if she was causing me trauma with the switch that I had to pick off the tree. <laughs> Right, and it was traumatic. I played Gilligan's Island one time in a creek behind some apartments off of 285, and I'm gone in a creek bed for like three hours playing Gilligan's Island with my friends. I don't know, I, I don't know how many swats I got, but I know when she found me finally, it was I got the switch that I got to pick, and I, I mean, she just beat me all the way home to the apartment. And not one time did we have a conversation about trauma. Right? So, and you know, when I parented, I, I love the information that's out there now. I'm not trying to throw anybody's new information um, down the tubes. I, I think that there are some things that are really great that we have learned. Um, when I parented my own children, authority was huge with me. So from zero to four, it's all I did. Zero to four, it's you will obey and it will be first time obedience, period. It was my only goal. 
My only goal was not how they felt about it. My only goal was, are we going to have a conversation about how you're feeling? Please try to explain to me why you're, you know, why you're saying A, B, C, or D. And I understand now that, that we do need to, to appreciate our children's feelings. So I'm not suggesting that I did everything right, but I am suggesting it was so simple when it was just, all I need from you is a yes right now because I'm your mom and I'm your authority and I'm not going to tell you 45 times in the middle of Target to do what I need to be done and then me not follow through, right? If you're that parent, don't raise your hand. So, you know, don't raise your hand. Authority is important to me. And so, anyway, I was just thinking about that and I was thinking about the simplicity of really who God is. And I think with all the knowledge, we have complicated this thing with him a little bit. We've complicated what it means to know him, we have complicated what it means, these three words that, that are our new mantra, where we're headed over this next 10 years. I think we've complicated follow, grow, go. The reason I think that is because I, I sit at coffee with, with many, many people. I sit with many, many people in my office and, and they are followers of Jesus, yet, you know, I, I'm, I'm just like... Okay, let, let's talk about follow for a minute. Simplicity, right? Somebody come up here. Let's see, Eva, come here. Come right over here. I want to show you follow, okay? I'm going to show you because we're, we're about to hit go and grow. Mark is out of town. When he comes back, we're hitting go and grow. We're going to be delving into the busyness of your lives. We're going to be delving into how do we grow and become. Um, so follow, we're about, to, we're about to turn the corner. So I want to make sure today that you understand exactly what follow means. What does it really mean when you say yes to following him? It's a simple word, a very simple word. So Eva, will you follow me? Yes. Okay, let's go. So, follow me. So, it's coming here. You coming here. Coming here. So, this is. I want to. Sh I want to show you something else. I'm. You ask me to follow you now. Okay. Ask me. Follow me. Yes. Why are you going that way? Why are you going that way? <laughs> okay, okay, I'm coming. All right, go somewhere else. Um, I cannot. Like you just stepped off the rug onto the wood. Right, now. I cannot, I cannot do that. So you're gonna have to, can we, let's come up with a different plan. So I really don't wanna do that. So, okay, go sit down. Okay, so <laughs> y'all get what I'm saying? Follow. It means to move behind someone or something and go where he, she, or it goes. It doesn't mean that we get options. Follow is not, follow when you say yes to following, it is a simple obedience. It is a simple, he has told you to go somewhere and you, you go. And what grieves me is I think because of all of our knowledge, because of the things that we expect to know, the answers that we expect to get, the way that we're trained to do life now, to know the whens, the wheres, the hows, the whys, the where are you taking me, the why would you turn that way? I mean, we, there's nothing that we do that we don't expect to have a full plate of knowledge on. I mean, I was, I was in the middle of taking chemo from some tree bark that they found in Africa and turned into chemo, and I needed to know everything about that drug. Absolutely everything. Right? And we treat, we kind of come to this thing with God where we, we are treating him the same, the same exact way. So... Put the scripture up that we've been, has been our key scripture for a while, Matthew 4, 19 through 20. Jesus is talking to Peter, and then he continues to talk to several of the disciples in the same passage. He says, come follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. Verse 20 says, and at once, 
at once they left. At once. Mark talked about this at once when he opened up this series when he was talking about the disciples actually having to go home and tell their wives, right? Having to tell their wives that I've quit my job, I've quit all this stuff. Do you all understand that following is an it's indicative of something changing in your life, changing in your position, changing in your viewpoints, changing in your location, changing in your action, changing in your attitudes, changing in your purpose. When we moved, when Mark and I were restored after our two years of counseling, um, you all know that story. It's like beating a dead horse sometimes. But nonetheless, it's our story, and, and we're grateful to be restored. So point being, when we moved here, imagine if, if I had said to him that day that he said, will you follow me to Atlanta? And I said, yes, absolutely I will. Imagine that I'm still living in Sylvania. That I'm still there claiming that I have followed him, claiming that I am doing life with him, claiming that we are one, claiming that there is no separation for, for between he and I, but I'm living in Sylvania, moving with him, following, in, it indicated that I had to pack a bag, I had to pack a house, I had to say goodbye to 17 years worth of memories. I had to say goodbye to all of my friends. I had to change what I was doing. I had to change my location. I did not know any of you. I did not know 135 Baywood Lane, Villa Rica. I didn't know the Publix that I shop at. I didn't know New Georgia Elementary. I didn't know Stella was going to do gymnastics. It totally changed everything about my life. Moving right? Just following off of that one word, following. The one word of, of following him. We have muddied that word. I feel like we've muddied it with our knowledge. And I feel like that you all would think it was ludicrous for me to decree that Mark and I are one and that I have followed him if, if there was no proof of that anywhere in my life. Right? Right? no matter how much I proclaimed it and no matter how much I said it and no matter how much I said it to him, it, it wouldn't add up. It wouldn't be one and one equaling two. And I say this in the most gracious way I can say it. Y'all probably know exactly what I'm about to say. I'm just wondering why we proclaim to have said yes Is it only for, I mean, are we, is it really just only so that we can, can make it into heaven? And I don't mean, I don't mean it to be harsh. It's one of the reasons I wanted to have a conversation instead of preach, because I don't want to be coming at you today. I want to have a conversation with you. If you're following him, what has changed about your position, about your purpose, about your behaviors, about your attitudes, about who you are. Because it was the very first thing once he started his ministry that he began to initiate with humanity. He began to initiate this, you've got to come to me, you've got to follow me, you've got to come to me, and you've got to follow me. And he continued to do this throughout his life. Um, just a few chapters over Peter, the same disciple that was just called here to follow him and who at, at once left his nets was then beckoned again in Matthew 14, 28. He was beckoned again when Jesus appeared to him on stormy seas and Peter says to him, Lord, if it's you, remember the story, they're all in the boat, the seas are stormy, they had just fed some people, just in, done some miracles. Jesus had gone to, to grieve, actually, his closest friend being beheaded. So he, he was coming back to them in the middle of the night, walking on the water, and, and they were scared for a minute. They thought he was a ghost. Y'all are with me, right? Y'all remember the story. And Peter says to him, Lord, if it's you, Bid me to come to thee. Tell me, come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came towards Jesus. 
he came towards him. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Verse 31 says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he says. Why did you doubt me? Why did you doubt me? When I, when I read this story, sometimes I think, you know, sometimes I think we look at this and, and it's like the, the, uh, the thing that shines the brightest is that he was walking on the water. I'm not sure that that's why Jesus put this story in here. I'm not sure he was having a water walking class that day, right? I mean, if so, he just would have lined them all up. He would have said, come on, let's do a new trick. Let me show you. We're, we're going we're gonna to learn to walk on water today. We're going to learn to walk on water right? And never again in, in scripture did he do it. Never again did he have a, a water walking moment with a disciple. I'm not sure it's about the water. I think we missed the point. I can imagine Jesus, when he reaches down and he grabs him, I can imagine him doing like Johnny Love does me when she takes my face and she's like, focus. <laughs> it's one of her new words. She just grabs me. She's just like, focus, focus. And then she just laughs. I don't know why she thinks it's funny, but she just laughs every time she says focus. I, I think that the point of the story is stop being so self-absorbed, wanting to save yourself because we have a kingdom that we are about to be about. And here you are concerned about the wind and the waves. Here you are trying to preserve yourself. I called you out here to focus on me. Come to me and focus on me. Stop trying to save yourself. Jesus knew, he knew that something bigger was going on than walking on the water. Why, why is it we always try to self-preserve? It's like in our relationship with the Lord, we're always trying to self-preserve. We want to save our personalities like there's some great, big, wonderful gift that we've got. We want to save who we are. How dare God try to chisel away at us and make us more like him because we, we like us. Like lay my life down for somebody else? I mean, but yet he's beckoning. He's beckoning them to understand it's not going to be about you. It's what he's telling them. He's like, dude, I'm about to check out of here. And if you think this kingdom is going to progress with you constantly needing to save yourself, if you think not just the kingdom on the planet, if you think the kingdom of God is going to progress in your life with you constantly being worried about you, constantly trying to save you, constantly having your mind on you, constantly thinking what you want, when you want, how you want, going where you want, doing what you want, living how you want. The kingdom of God is not going to manifest in your life. There's a huge difference in saying, yes, I want you, Jesus. Please take me to heaven. I do believe you are the son of God. I do believe that. We all do. Everybody on Facebook does. They've got a scripture right by their name. Right? There's a huge difference in that. And then having Jesus hold your face and saying, focus on me. Let's go somewhere. Let's go somewhere different. Let me be your Lord. Let me be your Lord. Let me be your God. We all want the fullness that saying yes to him brings, because I, I meet with, with us on a weekly basis. We all want peace. We all want joy. We all want satisfaction. We all want happiness. We all want the things that the kingdom provides and promises. And unfortunately, those come with a price. And it's not just the price that Jesus paid when he died on the cross. And this is a very different concept. Those of you who have been with us for a while have heard my testimony of having to be the good girl and check the boxes. Remember, I, I think I've shared a couple of times about the perfection and the being good. Jesus fixed that, right? He fixed that need to, to keep the law in order to be blessed. 
So I'm not talking about living by the law. I'm not talking about having a, a check book of all the good things that we need to accomplish for him to love us. He loves us with an unconditional, everlasting love. However, we will not have the kingdom of God and all its benefits manifest in our lives without crucifixion of ourself. There's no way around it. Absolutely no way around it. Doesn't mean we're not loved. It just means we're, we're coming up a little bit short here on the planet for what he wants. John 14, you know, it was easy for the disciples. It was easy for Eva to see me this morning, right? Easy for her to look, see where I was walking, see, see what I was doing. It was easy, even though he freaked out. It was easy for Peter to see Jesus right there. But there, there's coming a time, remember? And Jesus knew there was coming a time that he wasn't going to be there. He says this in John 14, if you, John 14, 15 through 17, if you love me, keep my commandments and I will ask the father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. The spirit of truth the world can't accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him for he lives with you and will be in you. He will be in you. What I want to ask you this morning is since you've been born again, since you've said yes to Jesus, have you been being led by him? Have you been being led by by him. If you're born again, he lives, he moves, he has his being inside you. Right? And that same beckoning that he gave to the disciples to come and to follow, he, he lives in you and he's saying, come and follow. And if you come and if you follow me, you're not going to be gratifying the deeds of the flesh. We are so confused about being led by the Spirit. Let me tell you something. It's not that difficult. If you're born again, you've been led by the Spirit. The Bible says that no man can even come to him except that the Spirit would draw him unto himself. He's not this huge mystery that's hard to figure out. He's alive. He moves in you. You can hear his voice. The Bible says that his sheep hear his voice. The voice of a stranger they do not follow. We've made it difficult. We're looking for the 10 ways that we can hear him, the 20 ways that we can be led by him. You know how you are led by him? You stop, you listen, you obey. You stop, you listen, and you obey. We have made it so muddied in 2023. We want somebody to interpret the listening. We want somebody to confirm the listening. We want to really understand the obeying. And he's just saying, hey, get out of the street. You're going to get hit. Right? All right, Romans 8, 1 through 14. Have we been being led? Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I love that this passage starts like this because I want to remind you, there is therefore now no condemnation. Being led by the Spirit is not a condemning word. There is no condemnation in you. You are covered by the blood of Jesus. When he looks at you, he looks at you through the blood of Jesus. This is not about how he looks at you. This is about what's going on in your life and the kingdom of God being manifest on the planet in your life so that you can live according to Matthew 5, 6, which says, blessed is he who hungers and thirsts after righteousness for he'll be satisfied, meaning you'll have more than enough, more than enough peace, more than enough joy. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy. As a people of God who are followers, are we exuding right standing with him? Are we exuding habits of righteousness? Are we exuding holy living? Are we exuding peace, just peace in itself? A follower of Jesus should be at peace. 
the shoot, they should coincide because it's what the kingdom of God is. It's who he is. We should be at peace. If we're not at peace, then there's, there's some sort of something that is off in our response to him and our being led by him because he is going to lead us into all peace and into all truth. He promises us that in his word. So when things like that are off, we have to go back and we have to look internally. Romans 8, keep going. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh. This is us before he's living inside of us. Not after, before. It's before he went to the cross. It's before we said yes to following him. It's before we asked him in. There was a weakness that we could not keep the law, that we could not live well. We had to have him living in us to do it. So if he knows we have to have him living in us to do it, where's the breakdown with him living in us and it not being done? I can promise you it's not with him. God did this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh. People, this is New Testament. It is post his death. This is not a scripture that is back in Moses' day in the law. This is New Testament living. In the New Testament, you mean we're actually being, being told not to gratify the deeds of our flesh? We're actually being told we don't have to because what floats around in today's society is anything. Any deed of the flesh. What even is a deed of the flesh, right? Isn't that, yeah, can you explain a deed of the flesh to me? Let's keep reading. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But the mind governed by the Spirit is life. It's peace. If you're governed by the Spirit, it's life. And it's peace. Keep going. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. Are y'all reading that? I mean, it just defines itself. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. It just refuses to submit to him. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, you, <laughs> All of you who said yes to following him. All of you who invited him into this space to be your Lord and your master. All of you have the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. And this is what he says about you. However, you're not in the realm of the flesh. You're in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, did you ask him to come in and live inside of you when you got born again? Was that an invitation that you asked the Lord, the King, the God of the universe to live on the inside of you? I believe it was. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they don't belong to Christ. But Christ, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, and it is, if you've been born again, that spirit lives inside you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of the spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, a requirement. You mean... In the New Testament, Jesus has a requirement on me because I thought he fulfilled all the requirements. I thought he did it all. We have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you're gonna die. But if by the spirit 
In other words, I've given you a way. I've given you a way to overcome. Not only have I given you a way, I am the way. And I am living in you. I have given you a way to put to death the misdeeds of the body. And you will live. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. Those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. So what does it mean when we proclaim to be a a child of God and we're not being led by the Spirit of God? I mean, you can think about that. If you're his kid, you're supposed to be being led by him. You're supposed to be being led by him. Galatians 5, we're going to talk through one more scripture, and then I just want to talk to you about life and being led by him. Galatians 5 says this about this spirit that lives in us. Paul says, so I say, walk by the spirit. And you won't gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what's contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other. That is the war, right? If you've been born again any length of time, you know there's this war, this war between your fleshly mind and the heavenly mind. The things that the flesh desires and wants, that self-preservation that we're talking about. All of the me, 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 that creeps up all the time. The my way, my enjoyment, my happiness, my desires, my locations, my purposes, my drives that wrestles with the God that's in there. The God that is saying, no, it's my desires, it's my way, it's my thoughts, it's my attitude, it's my word, it's my orchestration of your life, not your own. They're in contrary to the flesh. They're in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. New Testament, you are not to do whatever you want. How can that be? Because when I sit with people, they are amazed that they cannot do whatever they want. Because we have so thrown a message to the world that God loves them no matter what. And he does. It has gotten so misconstrued with us producing kingdom life on the planet and with us allowing him to produce in our own life. And because of it, we have weak, anemic followers of Jesus. I don't want that to be us. I don't want that to be us on this corner. I don't want that to be this house. I don't want it to be my life. We are about to turn the corner and hit grow and go, but if we don't get follow right, if we don't really digest what it means to follow him, we're never going to be able to grow and we're never going to be able to go. Who wants to follow a Christian who is just as broken and just as upset and just as without and just as filled with lack and fear and insecurity and doubt? Who who wants that? It's not going to produce in the kingdom. And so we have to get us right before we grow and before we go. We've got to. They're in conflict with each other so that you're not to do whatever you want. Keep going. But if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious, are they? They, I feel like they may have been a little more clear back in 1980 when my children who were in a group thread with me last night were laughing and you all are about to crack up as well. When in the 80s, the most I knew about sex is the thought that you could probably get pregnant if you made out too heavy in jeans. Even last night, I'm in the thread. I'm like, are we sure? Like, are we sure that's an impossibility? It's not the thought in 2023. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, 
jealousy, fits of rage, selfish, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. We're going to stop that scripture right there. I'm going to come back to it in just a minute. Those are pretty big words for 2023. There are some basic Christianity 101 things that you need to understand that you need to know that were not in question when I was growing up. And this is that there is one God, period. There is one word, period. It's called the Bible. Jesus was the, ma the word made manifest. He was the word made manifest. There is one Holy Spirit because he is, he is the same as Jesus and he is the same of God. We are many, right? I have my personality. Eva has hers. Eva has her story. I have mine. I have my genetics. She has hers. The same Holy Spirit that lives in me is the same Holy Spirit that lives in her. He has not multiplied himself to live in all of us. He is one God. So there's not a, a million little minion Holy Spirits that live in us, that each get to choose. That each get to choose what they think is right, what they think is wrong, what they think is holy, what they think is not, what they think is sin, what they think is debauchery, what they think is idolatry, what they think is right. But if we talk to people and we're having conversations with people, there are no definitives to these words. There's no definitives to the Holy Spirit. There's no definitives to what it means to follow God. We are creating it as we go along. And we are creating it with whatever culture throws our way. I'm going to read to you some of these definitions just because I'm going back to simple, right? I'm going back to, to 101, not what culture says. I'm going back to what these words are in the Bible so that you, you just understand. Just a second. Yep. Y'all with me? Sexual immorality. It's been a problem in human society since the fall because it's rooted in one of our strongest drives. The Greek word used here, pornia, from which we get pornography, encompasses a variety of sexual sins, including prostitutes committing adultery, engaging in premarital sex, homosexual acts, and incest. Impurity is an even broader term covering, these are defined from the Greek, from what it's written. Impurity is an even broader term covering any inappropriate sexual activity. That is sexual activities that make a person unclean and unfit for approaching God. One example would be viewing pornography, which has a long history and was part of the Greco-Roman culture. Sensuality refers to throwing restraint to the wind and indulging oneself without regard for normal moral standards. It denotes being so consumed by the pursuit of sexual pleasure that public opinion no, matter longer, no longer matters. Wild living is a modern term for it. So here, here's one of my questions for us. Why are people recommending Shades of Grey? There's another series out now. There's a new one. Why are people recommending that my daughters read that book, those book series? Christian people, asking them if they've read them. I 
I mean, we're, we're cool to throw in all the gender dysmorphia stuff and say, well, that's not God. But is it okay to read pornographic material if you're not viewing it? Idolatry, the worship of idols, was a major problem in the Old Testament and was common in the Greco-Roman culture of Paul's day. However, idolatry was not limited to material objects of wood or stone. When Paul describes covetousness, greed, as idolatry, he shows that idolatry can't take non, can take non-material forms, money, possessions, career, reputation, and ambitions of various sorts can all be forms of idolatry. And much else besides, the human heart is an idol factory. Sorcery, the English, the English translation of the Greek word pharmaka, from which we get the words pharmacy and pharmaceutical, it means using drugs. In Paul's day, it was applied ominously to drugs in which witchcraft were used for poisoning people. Today, sorcery would include astrology, fortune telling, and other occult practices. It would also include using drugs, legal or illegal, not for medical purposes, but for their mind altering effects, i.e. getting high. We're pretty cool to get high nowadays. Enmity includes negative attitudes and feelings and hostile actions towards other people, either individuals or groups. On an individual level, examples would include refusing to forgive someone, holding grudges, and working mischief against someone. At the group or community level today, enmity would encompass dislike and prejudice towards people of other races and religion, as well as hatred of political figures and parties. These are works of the flesh. I didn't create them. I didn't write the book. I'm just reading the book to us today, just very simply just defining it the same way I did follow because I'm not sure that we have a good grasp on what some of this stuff is. Strife, it's the relational discord and animosity resulting from a quarrelsome, argumentative attitude that takes pleasure in self-assertion and confrontation. Jealousy refers to the selfish resentment of another success or achievement, fits of anger, often called temper tantrums are explosive outbursts of anger against other people. Rivalries denote selfish ambition and putting oneself and one interest above those above the interests of another. Dissensions refer to unbiblical divisive teaching that's disruptive of church unity. Divisions are partly spirit or cliques around particular people or teachings. Envy is not merely begrudging the good fortune of others, but also maliciously resenting and wanting to spoil it and deprive others of it. Drunkenness speaks of revelry where alcohol impairs moral judgment and inhibitions and possibly leads to immoral actions. Orgies are closely connected with drunkenness and denote wild partying behavior. Something has happened, some, something has happened to us since we have realized that we're not under the law. since some of religion has been chipped away at, of which I am so grateful. I'm so grateful that I don't carry around that book where I'm trying to check everything off to get God to please me anymore. I'm grateful for that. However, I believe as, as a group of Christians, we have swung the pendulum to the other side where everything is now, everything that is okay that doesn't keep us out of hell is now fair game, right? We're like, well, we don't really go to, to hell if we're angry at somebody, Right, because we have to accept him, he covers us. So I'm really not gonna go to hell if I, if I don't do that. And you know, having a drink doesn't send me to hell. You're right, it doesn't. But what is this? What is this moms and women with all the wine drinking that's going on? It's like a new cultural thing that every night my friends are guzzling bottles of wine every night. Do you have to drink every night? 
just because you can, just because you can say a curse word and not bust the gates of hell wide open, does it mean that we need to be a people of God who go around cursing just because cursing doesn't send us to hell? Just because we can go to a bonfire with a group of people who are drinking, does it mean we need to be living wild lives? And the same Holy Spirit that lives in me is the same Holy Spirit that lives in you, right? Let's keep reading that scripture in Galatians. But the fruit of the Spirit, here's what we should be producing. Here's what we should be being led to. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. So my question to you back to the beginning is, have you been being led? Have you been being led by the Spirit? What does that look like in your life? I've got about five six, seven minutes, maybe actually five. I want to talk to you about some things that I looked back over my life, just a few stories where I've been being led by him. And I want to challenge you to be being led by him. Number one, as soon as I got born again, I stopped being unequally yoked with others because I was being led by him. So I didn't build intimate friendships with the world. Didn't mean I didn't have friends that were in the world. They were no longer my intimate sources of comfort and joy. And I I no longer buddied up with them in life. I refused to be unequally yoked. I left the guys that I I was dating who were cute and ungodly, who my flesh liked and my spirit did not like who when I entered a room with them and left their company, I felt sick because of the conversation that had taken place. I refused to subject myself to intimacy with people who I was unyoked with. Being led, I went and I got baptized by the Holy Spirit, meaning that I went and got baptized with the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Not because I think you have to go to heaven and that you must be baptized by the Holy Spirit to make it into his presence. I'm not hanging my hat on that nail, but I am hanging my hat on the fact that I want every bit of God, every bit of who he is and every bit of what he wants for me and everything that he wants to give me, every gift, every experience, everything that he has for me, I want it. I want it all. And so I was led to go get baptized with the Holy Spirit. It's kooky. It sounds kooky. I don't like its manipulation. I don't like the prophets who have manipulated people and things and situations. I don't like the way people have pushed people down in prayer ministry. I don't like the way some people have mimicked and taught people to speak in tongues versus it being a genuine gift of the Holy Spirit. There are a million things I don't like about spirit-filled living. However, I love Jesus and I'm being led by the Holy Spirit and I cannot escape the fact that he drew me to himself to cause me to want and crave and long for everything that he had for me. I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Locations, I have moved time and time and time again by the leading of the Holy Spirit. Mark talks to you all all the time about how he wanted to be a missionary. I did not want to be a missionary. I am not a, 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 I mean, I guess, yeah, maybe sometimes I am a country bumpkin, but I'm really not. Like, I don't want a farm. I don't want a cow. I don't want a goat. I don't want a donkey. I don't want to live on a dirt floor. Just not me, but I was willing right? I was willing. I said, yeah, I'll pack my bags. I'll go. You feel like that's where the Lord's taken us? Let's go. I've moved to Tennessee to be a youth pastor. I moved to ORU to to go to college. 
I moved to Sylvania to plant a church. I moved here. All along the way, you know what I had to do? I had to crucify myself. I had to crucify myself. I, I didn't rescue myself. I didn't rescue my ideas and what I thought and where I wanted to be. You know where I wanted to be? West Palm Beach. West Palm Beach is beautiful. It is right around the corner from Donald Trump's. It is lavish. It's where I wanted to be. It's not where I was because I, I followed the voice of the Holy Spirit. I followed what he wanted me to do. Behavior. I have had to live pure. I have had to crucify myself and live pure. And let's not think that women don't ever have thoughts about not living pure. I remember one time I wrestled for like two weeks thinking about an ex-boyfriend. I mean, he was just, he was, I, I had to be, I think we had all of our kids except Stella at this point. And I mean, just tormented day and night thinking about him, dreaming about him, thinking about him, dreaming about him, thinking about him. And I thought, well, you know, I mean, I might could call him. I might could find him and just say, hey, it's been a while. But that's not what I did because I was being led by the Holy Ghost and I was being led to purity. And so I went to my husband, I said, hey, I need to let you know something, dude. I've been thinking about this guy for about two weeks and you got to help me out. Exposing myself so that light can come and healing can come. Purity, forgiveness of others. You know how many people I've had to forgive. There are, I have conversations with people sometimes, followers of Christ, followers who have said, yes, I want to follow. And they're like, I have not talked to that person in 10 years and I am not going to. How do you do that and you're a follower? I don't understand how you let bitterness and unforgiveness just sit and rule in your, your hearts. And he's saying, follow me, follow me, follow me. And it is not being led by the spirit to not forgive, to hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness. And it's been time and time and time and time again that I've had to forgive. I have had to forgive disappointments. I do not label my life with the disappointments that abound. We are a generation that loves to label our life with all of our disappointments. We label it with our anxieties and our traumas and the fact that somebody has molested us and somebody has raped us. We label it with the fact that we've lost a baby or that we've had a miscarriage. I get it. Those things are painful. I'm not suggesting that they're not painful. Disappointments, that's why they are disappointing. They hurt. It's a disappointment and yet we label our life with it and just carry it around with us for years. I decided I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to die a bitter, broken woman because I'm labeling myself a woman who got cheated on. Who's going to carry a label like that? I, I, I don't wear those labels. The label over my life is that the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords resides here and that he has called me enough. He has called me holy. He has called me beautiful. He has gifted me. He has all of the things. That's the label that I'm carrying. I'm not carrying my disappointments around like a badge. We carry them around like they're a badge. That's not being led by the Holy Spirit. My mouth, even now, even to this day, I'm being led to correct my mouth. Maybe you all will do it with me. I was gonna do it in March, but I did not do it because I, I wasn't able to promote it and I wanna do it as a group. I was gonna do March Madness. I'm gonna wear a rubber band around my wrist. Why am I doing it? Because the Holy Ghost is convicting me about my mouth because I'm being led by him. Every time I say something negative, I'm gonna pop the crap out of my wrist <laughs> until I quit. If I say something critical, something that doesn't need to be in the atmosphere, something about somebody, something about some, something they've done, something about what I wish they would do, something that, that just is unholy or just doesn't need to be said, I'm just gonna pop it for 30 days. Why? Because I'm being led. Band, you can come on up. I'm being led by the Holy Spirit. Modesty, modesty is a big deal. I don't want men lusting after me. And women, you know when you're being looked at. From the age of 12 on, you know when somebody walks in the room and thinks you're cute. 
We know how to turn it on and we know how to turn it off. And we know what to wear and how to wear it. Modesty is a thing. It's a biblical thing. It hasn't disappeared just because of the culture, just because the culture's changed. We're not supposed to be enticing people to lust. So I want you to search your hearts this morning in worship. I know it's a heavy word. It's why I wanted to sit down and share it. I wanted to just have a cup of coffee with you and ask you, are you being led today? You being led by him, led by the spirit? Or are you gratifying the deeds of the flesh? I want to read the fruit of the spirit one more time. As we get ready to worship, I just want you to ask yourself this. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It's where we're supposed to be living, folks. It's where the kingdom of God resides. And if we're going to be true followers of him, if we're really going to follow him, Let that be your story. Put him in charge. To follow means you're number two. There's a number one. You're number two. You're not number one. You're number two. You didn't, following isn't getting a buddy to travel with. Following is having someone lead you somewhere. Two totally different things. Stand to your feet. Let's worship.